Yo, what's going on? It's your boy Kaz here once again for the Say Less Podcast. Thank you all for subscribing through iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, wherever it is. Make sure you follow us on all social media platforms at Say Less with Kaz. You can follow me at Kazim on Twitter and Instagram. This week is WrestleMania weekend, and obviously I've been talking a whole lot of wrestling this week. It's the only show in town next to the UFC, and uh, it's guaranteed to be a WrestleMania that we uh, absolutely never forget. Today on this episode, I got a good friend of mine. He goes by the name. He's professionally known as Corey Graves on uh, WWE. He's the lead color commentator for Friday Night SmackDown on Fox Man, and we get into a whole lot of things, bro. Uh, he's an incredibly funny, intelligent dude. We talk about his podcast after the bell and the episode that he dropped with, uh, John Cena. And, uh, it was a great conversation. We also talk about Tiger King and, uh, Carol Baskin being an absolute murderer who fed her husband to the dogs. I mean, tigers, <laughs> excuse me. And, um, a whole lot of other stuff, man. It's, it's going to be an incredible WrestleMania. And we talk a lot about that. We talk about, uh, his evolution as a color commentator. Uh, after leaving the uh, the wrestling ring, we also talk about um, the evolution of NXT and where it's gone and what it's become in the past uh, couple of years. So, Emilio, you know what to do, my brother. Hit the motherfucking music. Brother, what's the word? I'm living, man. How about yourself? I can say the same. Not eventful, <laughs> but uh, alive. Yeah, well, a lot of that's going around lately, man. <laughs> it seems to be a recurring theme, I've noticed. <laughs> Absolutely. How's uh, how's the uh, self uh, social distancing been holding holding you down, man? Um, it hasn't been terrible. I've I've been asking for some semblance of time off for approximately eight years. <laughs> uh, I didn't desire this much time off, but uh, the first week was actually kind of nice. I was like, man, this is what it feels like to sit on your couch and watch television yeah. and not have to go to work and not jump on airplanes. And uh, by this point, I'm pretty well ready to get out of the house in any way, shape or form possible. I've watched everything I've even considered watching on Netflix and Hulu, and uh, I'm just Pretty bored. Yeah, dude, we uh we got to talk about stuff that we watched on Netflix during this uh, downtime, man. Uh, you got into Tiger King, right? I absolutely did. Yeah. Uh, now, I was familiar with the story to an extent because last year, uh, Wondery, I think it's owned by the LA Times, put out a podcast. I think it was just called Joe Exotic. Okay. And it was, it was, kind of, it was the same story. But after watching the Netflix special, I feel as though maybe it leaned a little more toward uh, favoring Carol Baskin. Mm -hmm. Because in the podcast, there were a few little bits and pieces that were like, ah, she might be a little shady. But it was pretty much about how Joe was this bloodthirsty maniac. Um, and then watching the Netflix special kind of swayed a little bit the opposite direction. Well, you know, I mean, I don't think there's any redeeming qualities of any of these characters in the story. No, but, absolutely not. <laughs> but, I mean, that's what makes it so fun, man. Like, I feel like Tiger King is, like, the perfect show for, for these times right now, man. Like, there's nothing – I don't think there's anybody that's watched that show and hasn't feel be felt better about themselves <laughs> Honestly, I watched watch it for it. the same reason that I watch like Hoarders and My 600 Pound Life and all the A&E shows because it's like, oh, okay, well, if people have worse problems than I do. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, I mean, damn, let's uh, let, let's get into it a little bit, man. Um, so, it, granted, as crazy as everything is, WrestleMania week is this week. Uh, it's it's going to be a WrestleMania like we've never had before. Um, once you can say that with one thousand percent certainty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, it's literally never been done this way before. So if nothing else, it will be like never before. It, it'll be memorable for for some for one reason or another. And uh, you know, we, we talk a, a lot. And you know, usually back in the days when you know I was over there, I, I know how things go when uh, when everybody gets kayfabe and nobody really knows what's going to happen. Is that like the same right now going on with you guys? Kaz, I swear on my children, I don't know the first thing about what's going to happen at WrestleMania. Uh, I don't know the order of the matches. I don't know which matches are taking place on which night. I know absolutely nothing. And I kind of love it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, 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 go ahead. My fault. I mean, I mean it, this day and age, I mean, if you, if you follow closely enough or if you've watched wrestling for any period of time, you kind of know where things are going to go. 
you kind of have a pretty good idea of who's going to generally win or, or what the outcome is going to be. And for this, it just threw a, a total wild card over the entire event. So, I mean, literally anything could happen. If there's ever been a time where people always want to talk about hitting a reset button or totally changing, you know, just, just really shuffling the deck, this is an opportunity to do that. Will it be that? I don't know. I mean, we'll all find out at the same time. But uh, it's definitely interesting. Yeah, it, it kind of feels like this is uh, – and I was talking to uh, uh, Emilio, our good friend Emilio Sparks, about this yesterday. And we were talking about how this is the most perfect time to have, like, somewhat of a semblance of an off season, right? Like, I, I think it's at the point where there's – you know, things are going to get shut down for at least three weeks to a month. You know what I mean? You got your biggest show. I think it's in the can already from what's been reported already. Why not just – Take a few days to really reshuffle the deck and really, you know, try something new. And, you know, like you said, uh, reshuffle the cards for a little bit because, you know, granted, it's, it's been, it's been a, it's been the great college try right now, just even putting on a show with these circumstances. And that should be applauded. But at the same time, it's like, all right, now we really got to know what we're going to do for the next six months to a year because just, Everything has changed right now. It's not going to be the same world when we get back to, to, to any sort of live events. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think a lot of guys, uh, myself included, have, have discussed the perks of what would be an off season. I mean, that's been a conversation as old as time in this business. It's the only thing in the world that goes year round. And obviously, I think it'd be good for all the, all the boys and girls to be able to get their bodies right and just have a few weeks to, to heal and relax. Conversely, here's something that I, I'm going to say that I think maybe a lot of people don't. It's that when you work in this place for a long enough period of time, and you can probably attest to this, yeah. you get wired to the grind. Yes, absolutely. And I know for myself personally, and I'd say probably the vast majority of, of the, the wrestlers and, and staff and crew, after a few days off, everybody goes a little stir crazy. And especially at this point, it's been basically what three, four, going on four weeks that things have been off. I mean, not necessarily totally locked down, but that all the, all these problems sort of rising. And I don't know that company wide shutting everything down for any period of time would be conducive to anybody's mindset. I think it's one of those ones. I think if it was an option, uh, which nowadays, I mean, it's a different business than it's been for the you know past couple of decades. If guys need or want time off, they basically just have to say the word, right. uh, which is definitely an, an improvement. But that said, I mean, like, like to, again, to, to reiterate, I know I, I'm going crazy just because I feel like I'm cooped up. And, and I, the, the first week, not everything was locked down. I was just at home and I was like, wow, this is what it's like to be able to go to lunch on a Wednesday because I'm just home and I don't have anything to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, but now, man, I'm like, I'm, I'm chopping, chopping at the bit to do anything. I mean, luckily uh, I'm going to have a, a hand in the, the kickoff shows this coming weekend. Um, what, what exactly that role will be is still being determined just because of, you know, the, the situation being what it is. But uh, I'm ready to get back to work, man, and I, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Yeah, you're, you're not the only one, man. Like, uh, doing these podcasts have been, like, kind of therapeutic just so I just have other people to talk to and feel like I'm, I'm not just – being a complete waste of space for the next uh, right. couple of weeks, but right. I mean, it's it's been it's been insane, man. Like these are going to be the times that we tell our kids about. Like you know, you ever you ever have like those old aunts or old uncles or old grandparents that like always keep cash in their in their house or always yeah. are just super like not paranoid, but like one step below that just because of like how the war was or like how Vietnam was and stuff. Like this is going to be like that for us. Believe it or not, kids, there once upon a time you could not get toilet paper. Right. <laughs> right. Like, it's going to yeah. be like, yo, there was a time where toilet paper was basically currency in our world. Yeah, eh? yeah, it was like Bitcoin. <laughs> in the year 2020, it was like that. They were, they were equally uh, beneficial. Oh, man. So, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about After the Bell, man. Uh, and uh, when WWE started really getting into the podcast space, um, your show was one of the shows that, like, I – was immediately drawn to, and when they were talking about giving people shows, I felt like yours was a no-brainer. And, you know, obviously, out the, out the gate, we all saw why, because 
you said what you felt, man. Like you, you kind of went at it with, with everything. And, you know, that's had its good things and it's had its, its rough things that, that's kind of come with that. Um, and we know we have, we have conversations during, during Raw or SmackDown and, you know, when stuff is hilarious and stuff is like not so hilarious. Like how, how freeing has it been to just have that sort of creative outlet, um, during, you know, the regimented schedule that is the WWE? Well, to your point earlier, just it, it's been nice to have something to keep me occupied in any capacity since we, everybody's been locked down. Um, after the bell was sort of the guinea pig for the, the WWE podcast network, which is kind of slowly coming together. Obviously, you've got New Day, and uh, there's a couple more in the pipeline from what I understand. And so, it, it, as big of, as our company is, they never want to they never want to half ass anything. They want to make sure that everything is done to the best of their ability from a technical standpoint to the, the flow of the show. So there's a lot of trial and error. Uh, I was given some some suggestions. I don't even want to say directives as to what the show was going to be mm-hmm. and I, you know, dipped my toe in the water and I jumped across a few lines and got slapped on the wrist a handful of times <laughs> and everything kind of evolves and grows into what it is and now it's become more interview based which wasn't exactly what I had in mind when it started. But uh, if that's, you know, as as much as people like to say it as a negative thing, and I get hell on social media all the time, I'm a company guy because the company affords me a really good life, and I really like my job. So if that makes me a bad guy for supporting the company – then you know what I'm, I'm a bad guy. Yeah, that, uh, we talk about how terrible of a guy you are every week. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know me in, in a different realm than, than most others, and I, I am truly atrocious and the worst. Uh, <laughs> but but it's it's gotten to the point where I've I've this whole thing's been a learning process for me. I'm used to being a color commentator, which is 90 percent reactionary to what's either happening in the ring or what my partners say. Uh, so this whole exper- experiment has been new to me in that I'm driving the ship. I'm conducting the interviews. That's generally something that uh, you know Michael Cole would handle or Tom Phillips. And I'm, I'm now in that seat where I'm steering the show and where it goes. And I've kind of never really had a, an interview style, so to speak. So I'm kind of developing that. And what I really enjoy is, especially recently, now in the sort of stripped-down format, is I basically – just like you and I are, are have, I get to have conversations with guys. Like I'm, I am super stoked. I'm going to plug my own stuff here. Right please now. plug, please, for, please plug <laughs> for the episode that just dropped this morning, which is Thursday, uh, with John Cena. We've been, we kept it in the bag, open for a big rollout for WrestleMania week. And, uh, so we've been sitting on it since he returned the night he returned in Boston and John Cena, believe it or not, actually requested to do it in person. Mm. which is why it took so long to get him on the show. He was the one that said, you know what, I would rather sit down face-to-face and have a conversation than do a podcast over the phone. And, uh, you know, I, I respect the hell out of it, and I respect the hell out of John. So to be able to have that opportunity, and we were slated for about a 30-minute window during the day, and he and I just got chatting, and we're talking about the business. And say what you will about that dude, he is still to this day more passionate about this business than just about anybody. And, and it truly shone through when we were having this conversation. And it was like talking to an old friend, but it was at the same time talking to one of the greatest of all time and just to get his thoughts and his perspective. And he didn't hold back. And I think it was a bit maybe cathartic for John to, to have a wrestling conversation about the wrestling business in 2020 with somebody that's not trying to you know catch him or trip him up or get some sort of sound bite out of him and, and you know spin it some way. And, uh, man, we just talked about the business and he gave me his perspective on things. And I was, I was a fan again and the interview came naturally because I was genuinely interested. I, I, it was just the same as, you know, when he would pop into FCW or or NXT from time to time and have like a skull session and we get to pick his brain. I got to pick John Cena's brain, which, you know, not only is that, that's kind of uncharted territory because the guy's so busy in Hollywood and everything, he doesn't do a lot of it. So I was super stoked on that. And it kind of rekindled. I actually listened to it back uh, yesterday. My producer sent me a clip, and it, it was it was fun. It sort of reignited my passion to, to, uh, about the business and like some of the beautiful things that we all forget about and get caught up in, just because it's our job, it's our lives. And to hear that perspective was really refreshing. And I, and I stand by it, man. I think if you like pro wrestling, it doesn't matter if you're a WWE guy or the competition. Listen to it because I think it reaches you know all corners and, and all aspects of our business and why it's so magical 
uh, in, in a way. And, and to hear from Cena, man, who better? Yeah, I mean, he's a guy that, you know, is, is extremely misunderstood uh, when it comes to everything he's he's done for this company and done for pro wrestling in general. And just the, the sheer visibility of the uh, the entire, you know, form of entertainment. He's been at the front lines and like you, you said it, man, like you could kind of the thing that I, I dig about Cena is that like as popular and as as much of a star that he's turned into outside of the ring. Gosh, you see videos of him like in, in the crowd watching 205 Live at, at, at the Performance Center. You got, you know, he's always like trying to put people over on his Instagram page. And, you know, it doesn't say any captions, but like he's always, you know, if you're, if you're right, paying attention right. and you catch it, like you can tell that he's very, he's still very much. And, and he speaks a lot to that, uh, you know, without giving too much away, but just, just how he likes to give back and what he still watches and what catches his eyes. And the guy still has his finger on the pulse of everything happening in WWE. So despite whatever crazy Hollywood schedule he's on scene is always watching man and uh, and it was just really cool and, and you used the word misunderstood earlier and I kind of felt that when we were we were having the conversation even listening back to it the the at least the internet wrestling community perspective on John Cena. And what do those guys know anyway? <laughs> well, I mean, to, to listen to Cena talk about it, it's, it's actually, it is fascinating. And misunderstood, I think, is the, the most accurate word because nobody understands it better than John. Mm -hmm. And it was almost profound hearing him talk about some of these things that, you know, we assume, oh, he's so, so high up on the mountain. This, he never even sees this stuff. And, man, the dude's been on top for as long as he has for a reason because he, he has a feel for everything that's going on. And, and to hear his perspective on why he does the things he does, that was really fascinating. And, and beyond John Cena, that's just this week, just to have, to sit down and have these conversations there with a, with a Triple H or, uh, you know, anybody. To just be able to – I get to become a fan and a friend again, which is really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I compare John Cena to and, – and just that conversation. Like, you always feel like the people that are at the top of their industry like that – always have a pulse in the culture like no matter how big they get like I've, I've had like very very loose relationships with like people around jay-z and people are like oh man well you know uh, this guy's not on social media i'm like oh he's on social media like he's he's very tuned in to everything that goes on every rap conversation every you know up and comer the the stat the status of the game like he could be in the middle of of, of doing the big important things for the nfl and his company and all that type of stuff but if you can ask him about Griselda, then you can ask him about like West Side Gun and like some of these lesser known rappers, and he'll talk your ear off. And I feel like John Cena's kind of the same way. Is that sort of a fair assessment? Yeah, I think I think that's definitely the vibe I get. And, and to your point, whether it's Cena himself sitting there and watching every show, or he's definitely got people around him to keep him up up to date on everything. I mean, he name dropped Austin Theory, and this was weeks ago. Um, you know, Austin Theory had barely had a cup of coffee in NXT by this point, and Cena had read some interview that he mentioned, and and Cena's a big fan of the cruiserweights, you know, for the cruiserweights, which is you know, it's it's awesome to see. Um, but but some of the advice that he dropped to to guys that are, he even said at one point, he's like, I hope everybody on the roster is listening to this because it was his sort of not so subtle way of going, hey, everybody, get your ass in gear. And it was it was cool, man. I, I was motivated, inspired by it. Just you know, asking him a handful of questions. Awesome, man. Awesome, uh, Corey. I, I know you in a way that a lot of people don't really get to know you, and I'm and I'm privileged to be able to say that. So, how do you separate your on air personality with you know the regular guy at home in Pittsburgh? Man, when I'm at home in Pittsburgh, I am that regular guy. Like it's crazy to me. By uh, one of the only businesses around is a little bottle shop uh, right around the corner for me, and I pop in there and I sit there and I've had more conversation with the cashiers at the at the at wine and beer store than I have with any that I don't live with <laughs> in the last few weeks. Yeah, um, I, I don't know, man. It, it, it's funny when I'm in the bubble, and, and, when, and the bubble is big, and I'm talking about when I'm on the road, when I'm in an airport. There's always some semblance of me that's like, okay, I'm on. I, I'm I, I am Corey Graves now. And it, sometimes that's out of necessity because when I walk into a hotel at three o'clock in the morning, I don't want to take a photo with your kid who doesn't meet me. Um, <laughs> so I can be a little bit of a jerk at times. Exactly. And I, I'm, I'm as far as you know, as far as I can tell, and I, you'd have to ask someone who's known me my whole life. I'm. I try my best, I should say, to be the same guy I, I've always been. I mean, I'm not out to impress anybody when I'm not on TV. When I'm on TV, I am playing a character the same as anybody on here in the business. 
Um, obviously, I draw from real life because I am a bit of a sarcastic jerk at times. <laughs> um, but but that's my sense of humor. I bust people's chops. I make fun of things. I my girlfriend yells at me all the time. She's like, "Could you ever just be nice to me?" I'm very nice to you. I bought you flowers so I could make fun of you. you know, like, that's, it's, it's all about balance. But, um, yeah, man. I, I think it, it's funny how people. And it's weird in this day and age with social media, where obviously the curtain is never fully closed. And I try not to. I mean, I guess everybody tries to blur the lines, um, whether it be with, you know, in our business, you'll see Seth Rollins tweeting something inspirational about some of the, somebody did his workout. And then five seconds later, he's comparing himself to Jesus <laughs> and everybody's pissed off. Mm-hmm. And so, so it's a, it's a really difficult line to walk and to separate. So I, I basically take it on a case by case basis. You know what I mean? When I, when I'm not doing work related things, I'm still to the best of my ability, the same guy that I've, that I've been, and, and you know, hopefully, people around me would would attest to that. Um, I'm I'm actually <laughs> I'm not too bad of a guy. I'm actually pretty easy to get along with. I'm kind of shy, to be honest. No, with no, you. no. You're terrible. You're a terrible person. You got to oh, live the gimmick. Live the gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, your, your past, you were, you know, you came in to, uh, FCW slash NXT as a talent, as a in-ring performer. And, uh, you know, I don't think commentary was something that was, you know, and this is just me assuming you could correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think commentary was your first goal, but now you're essentially the voice of the company. You're the voice of the WWE. We hear you on video, video games, hear you on SmackDown, hear you on all the biggest events. Um, how's that experience been for you and what has been the one event that you've got to call that's been more memorable than the rest? Oh man. Well, yeah, to your point, uh, commentary was never even a blip on the radar. Uh, as far as goals go, that was probably the furthest thing from my mind until I got shut down with injuries and they gave me, you know, kind of the keys to the castle and said, Hey, figure something out. And I gravitated to the commentary thing, um, which, you know, it didn't happen overnight either. It's not like I, it was an overnight <laughs> sensation. I was I was sitting in a booth in the performance center for probably a year before I even got put on NXT. Um, so it, it was a long process, and it, it was something that I had zero exposure to, which I think might have helped in a way in that I knew nothing. I was a blank slate. So Cole would suggest something, or Tom Phillips would suggest something, or, or uh, Triple H even would, would chime in on, you know, hey, try this, or do this, or do more of this, or less of this. So they were able to kind of mold me, and I, I just I didn't know any difference. So it kind of I think helped me out because I just went, all right, cool, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Duly noted. We're going to fix that. Um, and it's gone so fast, to be honest with you, dude. Like it's crazy to me. Yesterday I was scrolling through Twitter, and it was uh, somebody had posted a clip of Nakamura and Sami Zayn oh, in yes. Dallas, and I, I sent the tweet to Tom Phillips because that was one of the shows that he and I called together. And I still, like, it still gave me chills hearing those first few notes of Nakamura's music. And that was magic to me because I was such a fan of Shinsuke in Japan. Um, it, it, I'm sure if you study hard enough on any of the old, even the NXT TVs back back in the day, um, I, I stole some of Shinsuke's stuff, like, move-wise. And mm-hmm. I, I was just, I was a huge fan of his. Never in a million years thought he was going to end up here in WWE. Uh, but I was stoked beyond belief when he got there. Um in a weird way, when you, you say being the, the voice of WWE, that still kind of freaks me out. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm ready for that responsibility. But I was so in, ingrained in everything, every Raw, every SmackDown, pay-per-view start to finish. I was like, I was so in the zone as far as everything from storylines to characters to backstories to stats. I mean, I, I had everything. And I, in a weird way, miss calling everything. Um, just because I felt so tuned in. And now it's like, oh, I actually have to go back and watch that, or I need a refresher, or I'm not quite as sure where I was before. Um, so it's all like learning and growing and, and adapting. And, uh, you know, I, as far as memorable moments, I mean, Nakamura and Sammy was one of my favorite matches. The whole revival DIY run in NXT mm. was incredible. Um, and as far as it, it's, it's I'm, I'm terrible at enjoying the moment when i'm in it i usually have to look back and go oh yeah i was there that was pretty cool i got to call the undertaker i I called sean michaels returning over at crown jewel in saudi which the whole thing was crazy and weird but it was like 
I just called a match with Shawn Michaels, Kane, Triple H, and The Undertaker. Mm. Like twelve year old me is freaking out right now. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and but any of that, even like the Goldberg stuff, man. I was a Goldberg fan. We're all Goldberg like, fans. Let me let me tell you something about Goldberg, bro. Like my my girlfriend, she I, I've 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 got her more into wrestling now than she's probably ever been in her entire life, right? And you know she loves she's she's a she's a smart fan. She's getting there. Like she likes the NXT stuff. She's Keith Lee's her favorite wrestler, but boy. When she sees Goldberg, she a, a reaction comes from her that I don't see from literally anybody. And for some reason, like, she is just the biggest, like, I can't stand Goldberg, but I understand why. Because everybody grew up a Goldberg fan. Everybody yeah, watches yeah, the show, yeah, so we get it. What's, what's, what stands out to me personally is my, my son, my oldest, he's, he's 11 years old, couldn't really care less about wrestling. Not his thing. He's just, yeah, he likes to fiend Bray Wyatt. Mm-hmm. He could care less about Bray. He likes to fiend. <laughs> and he loves Goldberg. And, and he was obviously not around when Goldberg was on top or a thing. But that just to me speaks to, you know, I think a lot of people always lose sight, especially as, as passionate as we all are about this business. We're so passionate and so obsessed that we decided to dedicate our lives or parts of our lives to this. Even if it's the you know the, as much crap as I give them and, and we all do, the the people that are so passionate that they spend their free time complaining on the internet, it's because they love this business and right. they, they want it to be the best. And I understand that. You just need to work on your tact a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all on the same page. The yeah. goal is always the same. It's just a matter of how we go about doing that. But I think people lose sight as to what WWE is because yes, we are a wrestling company. At the end of the day, it's it's we call it sports entertainment. It's pro wrestling, no matter what color you paint it. But WWE is a global brand that is marketing to millions and millions of people. Many of those people are kids, and it, it, it wasn't anything that WWE did to invent Goldberg that connected with my kid. But for whatever reason, whatever Goldberg has, he comes through the screen to my eleven year old son who doesn't really care about wrestling. <laughs> You know what I mean? So to me, that speaks. I have the utmost respect for that. And, and you know, not not to keep going back to Cena, but Cena understands that so well, which is why he was on top for so long. He has something that connects. He knows he's not a great technical wrestler. Goldberg's never going to give you a, a five star in ring classic, but there's something about him, and and I think that's what people lose sight of because they go, "Oh, we're tired of this guy." You you are that's your prerogative. You're absolutely within your rights to have opinions on things and be tired of things and prefer other things, but. Take a step back and understand what you're doing, what you're selling, what the product is, what the business is. It's like McDonald's. Not everybody likes McDonald's, but they're not going to change the recipe for the Big Mac because it's the Big Mac. Mm -hmm. Because people know it and they love it. And that's what works for most of their customers. And some people are going to say, screw McDonald's. I'm going to go eat it so fresh or or whatever. (laughs) Okay, that's cool. That doesn't mean like McDonald's is bad. And I'm only using fast food analogies because I love McDonald's. No, oh, who doesn't love McDonald's? I, was about to get, I wish I could get a Big Mac right now. <laughs> McDonald's, look, look, at this, look at this analogy. McDonald's and Goldberg. Everyone knows who they are. Everyone likes them and knows they're fine. But people just can't find enough reasons to complain about it. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they usually end up on top, which is, I guess, the same, <laughs> the same exactly. deal with, with exactly. the Golden Arches. Uh, it, it's business. Yeah. Uh, so, so I mean, you mentioned something about Goldberg and Cena and, you know, them not being the guys that will ever give you the five-star classic, but they all have that it thing about them, right? And another person that has that it thing about them is Roman Reigns. And uh, he, re- he recently just went on uh, Instagram to pretty much, you know, talk to the fans and, and kind of like put, put another peek behind the curtain as, as to why he's uh, decided to not participate in uh, WrestleMania this year. And um, clearly, I know you can't speak for him, but, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of uh, worry right now about what's going on in the world. And, um, you know, Roman being, you know, more or less the team captain of the locker room, like, I always call him the Tom Brady of the locker room. Like, you know, even if he's not the champion, he's he's, he's the guy back there. No um, doubt. No so doubt. so what, what were your thoughts on that? And did, did you kind of feel that a lot of people sort of followed his lead uh, you know, by by choosing not to participate in uh, WrestleMania this year. To the best of my knowledge, Roman's the only one that voluntarily backed out. And I could be wrong on that. This is just like, again, I, I have so little information about anything that's happened 
you know, in the last few weeks. Right. Um, but when I, I heard the news basically the same way everybody else did, I read it on, on I think ESPN or, or I may, may have popped up on my TV. Mm. And my first thought was I'm concerned for my friend. Uh, you know what I mean? I, Roman and I, we, we go back to the FCW. He was one of the guys I gravitated toward and our families would hang out and whatnot. Right. Um, so I, I was just concerned for Joe, the human being. And I, I texted him as soon as I found out and just said, hey, man, just double checking. This is preventative, not reactive, right? And he said, no, man, I'm all good. It's just being safe. You know, he's got a lot going on in his life. Obviously, a very public battle with, with leukemia. Um, I, I don't think anyone has a problem with what he did. Uh, I, for one, respect the hell out of it. And at the end of the day, hopefully, he's going to keep being the Tom Brady of our locker room for the foreseeable future for the next five, ten years. So, you know what? He's going to miss a big game, but that doesn't mean he's any less valuable. You know what I mean? We, we still need him to, to steer the ship for us. Um, so, and to your point about being the locker room leader, it's been made very well known throughout the business, the company. If, if you don't feel comfortable or you feel unsafe, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. But back to my previous point about people just being wired. They want it, They want to be. It's WrestleMania, man. In any capacity. As bizarre as this one's going to be, it's still WrestleMania. And in a weird way, there's that more curiosity. Could this be the coolest WrestleMania ever? You know, I've been thinking you it. Like, know. the more the more the days get closer, I'm just like, man, if there's anything I'm certain about that company, and granted, you know, I've said this to anybody that'll listen to me. Like, people that, like, love to complain about storylines and stuff, like, those guys that are in that creative writing room are some of the most, like, biggest wrestling fans in the world like they they everything that you think that you thought of on your twitter timeline or or on your instagram or your podcast like trust me they have thought of it 20 times over um but I, i think they're in a unique situation where they have so much creative freedom to just do something that's never been done and, and most likely never will be done again. So I'm, I'm starting to warm up to, you know, uh, Lucha Underground Mania and just these you three things. Yeah. And again, it's not, I, I, could, I mean, I'll bet money right now. It's not going to be everyone's cup of coffee. Right. But, you know, it, it very well may turn on a few people, you know, holy cow, I haven't watched wwe in years and this is what it's like now this is awesome mm-hmm. or you know it may just spark something it may be some little the, the way they shoot something or or what to your point about you're talking about the, the creativity in the writer's room think about just the, the camera guys and the, the technical skills that we have on our staff i mean be from lighting to, i mean we've got guys who work on movies full time right yeah, this this could very well end up feeling like you know a two-night miniseries that you'd watch on uh, you know fox or abc or something as opposed to your standard wrestlemania i don't know if that's going to be everyone's cup of tea but it's going to be something man i'm I'm, I'm very curious yeah extremely curious man i think it's going to be i'm not going to go jump out the window be like oh man they're going to blow it out the water but like the the curiosity is peaked the curiosity is absolutely peaked right now um and to to your point though man it, it, it Everything starts at the top of the food chain, and at the top of the food chain, we both know that there's one man who will go over and above and beyond to prove anyone that says he was wrong that they were the ones that were wrong. Mm, that and is... if this is an opportunity to stick it up everybody's rear end, there's one man that's going to do it. <laughs> Big smile on his face. I'll put I'll put a dollar in the collection plate for that one, man. I've, I've right? seen I mean, we've seen it we've seen it firsthand. <laughs> um, uh, back to NXT, and, and then, you know, I'll have, like, a few more questions, that we'll wrap this sure. up. Uh, man, you were, like, the golden... You were, like, the voice of, like, what a lot of people would say is probably the golden era of NXT, right? Like, you were... You you know, when they first got on the network specials, and you had the Sami Zayn and, and Cesaro matches, and the Kevin Owens run, and the Finn run, and the Nakamura runs, and all these incredible, you know, moments in NXT history... To where it's at right now in 2020, where it's on the USA Network and they have, you know, the Survivor Series was an incredible, you know, moment for them where they could stand on their own two feet. And now, you know, they're going head to head with, you know, the the the, the shiny new toy in town on TNT. Um, just I would love, just love to get your general thoughts on NXT and, you know, how do you think they could uh, form themselves going into the future? And, uh, you know, especially in the way where getting called up isn't 
necessarily a thing anymore. It's almost like it's almost it's almost a unilateral instead of vertical. You know what I'm saying? Right, I mean, it's right. like people just kind of like floating in and out now. So, what's your thoughts on NXT right now? Man, I'm I'm super stoked to see what NXT's grown into, especially coming from the you know the humble beginnings that were FCW, and I think. It, I mean, we've, we've all pretty much gone on the record and said that, that that initial class from Sammy and Rollins and and oh, all the Shield guys, everybody, that first wave of NXT, we were all pissed off and felt like we were forgotten. So we kind of, we had like massive boulders on our shoulders. Every night we stepped in the ring, every even to the point when we started growing and, and we, I was super stoked seeing Finn and, and Kenta and all these guys come into the fold in NXT because it really felt like, wow, we're, we're getting legitimate now. Um, now it's legitimate. And now it's just a matter of trying to, to find that next hot hand and keep the, the momentum going. Um, you figure how, how much more talent there was a few years ago when you could sign a, a Prince Devitt or, or you know, these international superstars. They're all kind of under our banner or under somebody's banner right now. If they're not under ours, they're under contract somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, okay, now's the time where we'll see people really step up and grow. And and you might have some, you know, dark horse come out of nowhere and, and set the world on fire in NXT. Uh, it, it, there's, there's such different products. Not everything that happens on Raw or SmackDown has worked in NXT. Conversely, you know, there's some things that were great in NXT that just never quite translated to the the masses back to selling to everybody. You get these niche audiences. And, you know, I, I love to death. I don't mean disrespect, but Adam Rose was was a fan mm-hmm. in NXT. Man, the, the fans latched onto him, and, and he, the Rosebuds, man, they were out of here at one point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he was arguably the hottest thing in NXT for you know a few months to the point where they called him up, and it just didn't click. It just didn't connect. Um, so I think, I mean, there's a, there's a wealth of talent. There's, there's, I would dare say like a bottleneck of talent in NXT of guys who are signed, who are just dying for, for TV time. I saw, uh, Dexter Loomis. Yeah. This, yeah. I saw him last night. Yeah. There's a guy, I mean, he paid his dues. He's been around. He, I think he was in TNA for a cup of coffee. I, I remember, I don't think I've ever met him to be honest with you. Uh, but I, I've known he was here and I'm like, Oh, this guy's finally on TV. There are so many guys like that. that have Same so thing with, uh, 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 gosh, Malcolm Bivens, uh, Stokely Hathaway. In the yeah, Indies. He's... Exactly, man. There's so many guys that have, that are so wildly talented and are just waiting to be given the opportunity. And there's just, it sounds ridiculous. Everyone says, Oh, well, they got two hours each week. That's plenty of time for everybody. Yeah, is it though? <laughs> <laughs> it's really not. It's really not. It's especially yeah. with the wealth of talent you have down there. So I, I think NXT is going to be just fine. You have to remember, man. It, it's still new. It, it, it's new in this platform. It's new on it, cable, being live every week. These are some. These aren't minor growing pains that every wrestling company goes through. You know, there's only a handful of companies on the planet that know what this is. So you're growing, and, and this. This talent's never. Most of the talent has never been exposed to it before. Most of our audience don't know what or didn't at least didn't even know what NXT was. You figure two and a half million people, give or take, are watching you know Raw or SmackDown generally. And when when NXT was on WWE Network, you're getting I mean several hundred thousand each week, but it was just a fraction of what our our general audience is. Right. So now there's that you got to have that period of time. To, for the, the crowd to learn who these people are and for fans to understand, you know, the way our business works, the storylines change and twist and turn so frequently. If you don't know what the hell's happening, you might as well just, you know, start from scratch because there's so many turns and twists and, and this guy was aligned with this guy and there's a backstory and it, it, it can be daunting. You know what I mean? I don't know if, if I would have been a, a wrestling fan to the extent that I am if, I, if things were as... Uh, I don't want to say convoluted, but the, the there's the a lot to follow. Right? There's a whole there, lot to follow, that's, that's man. Like it's yeah. yeah. There's so much going on. So like, I mean, when I was a kid, it was hey, here's Hulk Hogan. He's the guy you like. He's the good he guy. Everybody, yeah. except <laughs> this guy might beat him. Right? Oh, nope. Hogan beat him. What's next? It's pretty simple. <laughs> you know. And nowadays, nothing is that simple, but it's, that's entertainment as a whole. Yeah, I was about to say, I, I guess that kind of speaks to the way people uh, consume entertainment now. I mean, like you know, you, you can't just. You, 
It's the same way where I look at television ratings. I'm like, that's not really a accurate description of if your product is popping or not. I mean, we got internet, we got YouTube, we got streaming services, you got social media, like you got all these factors now. Whereas back in the day, it's like, oh, they did a four two, great show. You know what I mean? Right. Like that's it's different. Have, it used to be appointment and viewing. It was before the days of even DVR. Usually, you had to you had to watch it or else you didn't know. And now there's so many different ways to consume. And, and back to the, the point about everything just being different, and it, it made me think. I started watching the third season of Ozark yesterday, and I love that show to death. I love the first season, love the second season, and I'm watching even the recap before the first episode of this season started. I'm going, I don't remember that. Wait, why? Hold on, hang on. <laughs> because if you, some of this stuff, I think it's almost built for binge watching, where you're you're. It can have so many twists and turns because generally you're going to sit there over the course of you know a couple of days or a day and be able to follow every twist and turn and have it be fresh in your memory. The last season ended. I don't even know how long ago. So I'm watching this and I'm going, I don't even know who that guy is and why is he mad at this? Wait, oh, oh yeah, I forgot that that guy died. It, it's it's you know it's tricky. So I, I think it's coming across all sort all forms of entertainment right now for sure. All right, so uh, la- last two questions before we head up out of here, man. WrestleMania is this weekend. Uh, you have no idea what's going on, but what is the one thing you're looking forward to seeing at the show? Is there a specific match? Is there a specific performer that you want to see perform? Uh, what's the one thing you're looking forward to? I it, it, This is me being, I don't know if it's just optimistic or pessimistic, but I'm really curious as to what Edge and Randy Orton is going to look like mm. with no fans. For the simple reason that these are two of the greatest of all, all time. They have done everything there is to do. They've headlined WrestleManias. They've been every champion. They've worked with everybody there is to work. I don't know if they've ever worked in, in an empty arena. I don't think so. I mean, I don't think there's any situation least, that would call for yeah, it. At least not in a well-publicized manner. Right. So I'm kind of curious to see, because you've got two super creative, wildly talented guys that are veterans who, who can, I mean, have great matches in their sleep. What's this going to look like in, in an arena where there's nobody? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm very, very, I, I think across the board, not to downplay your question, but I think just curious is the best way to describe my feelings towards this whole weekend. And add to the fact that it's, this is Edge's first singles match in almost a decade, which is like, God, what? Well, all of the all of the curiosity to me is, you know, obviously the empty arena and, you know, some matches being off site, all that stuff is, is definitely going to pique my interest. But Edge just, you know, as great as he looked at the Royal Rumble, man, like, you know, I know that 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 uh, that adrenaline and, you know, just I, I remember that day so vividly because of the day Kobe Bryant died. And like, I just remembered that just dark ass cloud throughout the whole day. And then just hearing his music, like everybody, you could tell just everybody just needed something to cheer for. And I think all of us just at the same time was like, oh my God, yes, this is it. This is a completely different thing because now it's like, we need you to do it again, Edge, but like times a (laughs) hundred, you know? And and, you know, just listening to you say that, it kind of made me think. I mean, I I don't know that it was the intent, but kind of by default, the, the whole world right now has got that dark cloud. Yeah. I mean, for different reasons, obviously, everyone was mourning Kobe, but it's got that dark cloud. Everybody's just kind of looking for something to just escape for a little bit. And, man, if we can be that for, for two nights this week, if we if WWE in, in whatever capacity and, you know, circumstances be damned, be an escape for, for a couple million people, this weekend to just forget about how sucky it is to be locked inside and not be allowed to go to your favorite places. And you can just sit down and enjoy and, and be a fan and forget about life for a while. I think at the end of the day, man, I think that's why we do what we do. Absolutely, man. This It's 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 the one thing you guys are uh, – gosh, man. Like if, if all the things that I've binge watched all from Netflix to Hulu, like I keep finding myself going back – to watching just old wrestling shows, old WrestleManias, because if there's one thing that the WWE does is in times like this during our country where, you know, I, I think back to 9-11, I think back to war times, I think back to all these things, WWE has always been on. So the fact that they're still on and still doing this, you know, me 33 years into being a fan, uh, it's, it's, it's an incredible time right now. And I'm extremely Extremely looking, extremely forward to uh, this weekend, man. And last question, I want to ask you: Carol Baskin absolutely fed her husband to those tigers, right? 
I just felt it was a little suspect when she specifically singled out sardine oil as how you get somebody <laughs> to eat a tiger. Because you could have said anything. I mean, I wouldn't have even batted an eye if she, if she had said, "Oh, you got to cover them in butter, or you got got to spray them down with something delicious. Cover them in chocolate syrup, no, <laughs> sardine oil." I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know you could buy that somewhere. Like, where do you even no, get sardine I didn't know oil? That was like a mass-produced or or any anybody used sardine oil for much of anything. So for her to pinpoint. Like, no, that's not how you do it. you got to put sardine oil on it. That, oh, good. was a bit of a tell. Just, just a little bit. You, you, Allegedly. You got, you got to give your lawyers something to work with, man. You can't just, <laughs> you can't just <laughs> leave it at the rim for them like Blake Griffin so somebody can just dunk all over it. <laughs> uh, Corey, man, it's great talking with you. Thank you so much for coming on the show, bro. Stay safe out there and uh, looking forward to WrestleMania this weekend, man. My pleasure, man. I'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Stay safe and take it easy. Yes, sir. And that's a wrap on the show. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kazim. That's K-A-Z-E-E-M. And you can follow the page on Twitter, Say Less with Kaz. That's S-A-Y-L-E-S-S-W-I-T-H-K-A-Z. Thank you so much. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, SoundCloud, all those places. Appreciate y'all listening. Leave a nice review, maybe a comment if it's nice enough. And I'll catch you next week or next day. Or however long we're doing this shit. But say less. <laughs>